Okay, so today's is temperance, which uh, basically, and it's also called the heavenly alchemist. And the, the theme of this card connects temperance with Aquarius, the water carrier. Aquarius rules the circulation of the blood and has been associated with the circulation of ideas. Traditionally, it symbolizes the dissolution of old forms and the loosening of rigid bonds, uh, heralding a liberation from the world of phenomena. So no mere mortal is in the scene. All this is taking place in the hero's unconscious without the participation of the ego. The focus is the pouring of the blue into the red. If we take these two bases to represent the unconscious and consciousness, inner and outer, the angel by her ritual pouring helps the hero to reconcile these two aspects of life. Before these can safely meet, preparation must take place in the psyche. This is the ceremony the angel presides over. She has the ability to encompass both sides showing equal concern with both the red and the blue. Jung said angels personify the coming into consciousness of something new from the deep unconscious. Here the angel does not speak. If the hero wishes to hear the angel's message, he must initiate a dialogue with her. This dialogue establishes a living relationship to answering the other within. Jung emphasized the daily necessity of reconciling the world of our dreams with our daily lives. If we do not reconcile them, these two worlds will intrude on each other in a most confusing way. The rational mind can intrude into the image world of the unconscious and disturb its healing work. The unconscious mind threatens the order of our everyday life. The hero's awareness of the angel is still buried too deep for his consciousness to penetrate. But nevertheless, he begins to understand intuitively that he too is marked. Having emerged from his confrontation with death, he is twice born. His new awareness begins to flower. A dynamic change in libido is about to take place. Having faced the terrors and confronting the skeleton of, the de of death, the hero is disoriented and set apart. His conscious personality is temporarily shattered. Through its cracks, a new light can be seen, the potential of wholeness. Now it's time for this new libido to be poured into a new container. This cannot be consciously willed or directed, however. Psychic energy, says Young, is very fastidious thing which insists on fulfillment of its own conditions. However much energy may be present, we cannot make it serviceable until we have succeeded in finding the right gradient. We know that neuroses represent a loss of capacity for wholeness and the holiness of religious experience. In temperance, contact with the numinance is reestablished. Um, the symbolism of temperance is more abstract and impersonal than that of the chariot. We now see the situation from the aspect of eternity. Energy previously experienced as two separate beasts is now revealed to be one current. In the chariot, the purpose of libido was to move us forward on our journey into the outer world. The temperance libido itself undergoes transformation. In justice, we saw the two opposites held apart by a fixed bar. Now they are shown as red and blue containers for one unique flow of being. In death, brandishing time's weapon threatens to cut short the hero's mortal existence. By facing this, the hero is lifted into the realm beyond time. The angel provides a connection between historical time and sacred time. To use Mercia Alade's term, Alade describes this realm as a sort of eternal mythical present that is periodically reintegrated by means of rites. In temperance, the ritual of the pouring reconnects the hero with the sacred world he had glimpsed before 
as the hangman but has since lost. This balancing of opposites is a theme that we see as a continuous interplay in the cards between the masculine and feminine energies. Justice shows a woman. Is anyone not muted? Because we're getting a lot of background noise. I can't tell. Um, but she holds a sword, a symbol of of masculine logos. The hermit presents an archetypal old wise man, yet he wears the flowing robes of Mother Church. The Wheel of Fortune dramatizes the cyclic interaction of all opposites to be followed by strength, in which a lady and her lion intermingle their two kinds of energy in symbiosis. The hangman shows us someone achieving balance between heaven and earth, seeing the necessity for non-action and death, male and female, king and commoner are chopped up and plowed under pre preparatory to reorganization and reassimilation, which begins with this card temperance. The cards in this row are called the realm of equilibrium. They alternate between the general and the specific. We begin with the general problem, justice, showing the universal moral dilemma, the problem of determining innocence and guilt. The hermit with his lamp then gives us a more individual and human approach to the problem. The wheel of fortune brings us back to the universal, posing the question of fate versus free will. The next two cards attempt to answer this question. The first alternative, the lady with the lion demonstrates how bestial nature might be tamed. The second alternative, the hangman, hanging helpless, but whose spirit is free to find meaning in the suffering. Death brings us back to the universal, showing us man and beast are powerless to avoid the skeleton death. And now our perceptions are cleansed connecting us in a divine yet human way with the immutable world beyond the act of time sight, the beginning of the great work. And that's today's. Yeah, well, uh, that uh, it, it, description of Aquarius was particularly beautiful. Uh, I had never heard that, uh, her described so wonderfully. And, uh, um, you know, the one thing is that she uh, circulates the ideas from, uh, it, I, I, you know, I, I just don't think that there is any alternative. If you want to make the living unconscious conscious in your own awareness to, to the uh, boring activity of taking your dreams and going through each line reading them over and over, drawing them. I mean, the only way that you can uh, bring life to them is to, is to read their messages and to incorporate them. And then you, you become permeable because you are used to their consciousness. And now that helps you go down in uh, to a state where uh, they, they are available to you. If you go down with no knowledge of how they speak, uh, then it's uh, they'll never become alive in you. Uh, you. You know, I find this too. If you see the uh, the more that you do this, the more and you go into an active imagination specifically to get a vision, they will become uh, more uh, actually uh, vibrantly alive, three dimensional, and you know. And, and this is, comes from someone who's very fumbly at doing these things, not very available. Well, anyway, I'm just say hi to Azeen and Ava and Kat who came in. And I think, I don't know if there's anybody else. Uh, but anyway, well, let's get started on the, uh, uh, keep going through here, watching the ups and downs of the, of the, uh, of this uh, process of, uh, yeah, you know my uh, 
wife was uh, talking about this uh what we we know uh, well actually i hope she comes soon her name's susan lawrence and uh we were talking about uh jungian analysis and uh i said well i said if you can really call it psychology I mean, this is that bizarre rit she calls it the bizarre ritual every day i do that's 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 it you know so this this and we're going to describe this bizarre ritual here so anyway we're going to start let's start again with the tree the newman of the tree that it represented in the man covered with tree bark you know uh is the uh this masculine newman of the tree uh uh i, I think we left and we didn't answer ava's comment why is he covered in tree bark well you know that that and uh, i have a question for uh to ava why is her um animus covered in in bear fur you know why why does she have an animus in her dreams that shows up in bear skin you know it's uh it's just this uh image uh of the the uh which, which we're going to uh, re really go into here in a second of the nature of of the depths and how different they are from uh from our uh you know our our ego consciousness you know i mean absolutely different here here's young now this is his personality number two and he uh this this was in his later life he told someone this this is not something this was just words he spoke to some someone by my very presence i crystallize i am a ferment he says uh a, he says it is the truth a force of nature that expresses itself through me i am only a channel several times i have said things that i didn't know and that i forgot at once after having said them i let it enter that's the objective attitude if life had led you to take up an artificial attitude, that's really the way we live. We, our ego consciousness is artificial. Then you wouldn't be able to, it's not nature, you know. Then you wouldn't be able to stand me because I am a natural being. By my very presence, I crystallize. I am a ferment. Now, not him himself, but what comes through him. The unconscious of people who live in an artificial manner senses me as a danger everything about me irritates them my way of speaking my way of laugh, laughing they sense nature so they're sensing uh the man in tree bark or uh and we learned this from uh the uh, red snow white and rose red that the man in um uh bear fur in bear skins you know and this is this is this image uh that we see all over cathedrals is the green man uh you know the man who's who is uh, has leaves uh growing out remember in the red book uh, uh, after uh young meets the red knight suddenly uh leaves start growing out of his uh his body you know so he was somewhat uh became this man and this this is from Christiana Morgan. Uh, she she be uh, from the vision seminar. She beholds a face with eyes closed. She besought the face, "Oh, open your eyes unto me, so that I may behold them." And then the face became very dark. This was a face covered in fur. Then the face became very dark. It's pan, really. I think. And slowly the eyes open, and I beheld what no man is meant to see, so terrible, so full of woe and beauty. I cry, cried out that I could bear it no longer, and the eyes closed. These eyes of woe and beauty, uh, that, that's what uh, Jung uh, said that the uh, eyes of the divine are full of, and the eyes of animals, of woe and beauty, of suffering and beauty. And really, this this actually describes uh, the evolution of nature of life on Earth is is both woe and beauty. Uh, it's 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 suffering, uh, you know, killing uh, of, of 
uh, you know, eating and, and is killing, yet uh, the beauty aspect of it. So this is, this is the dream maker, you know. Now, um, so this, now what she got here, though, uh, in set, the fact that it was a, a, her animus is a man in tree bark is not very differentiated. So, uh, and the fact that it's male is in uh, the animus is only an intuition. The animus is an intuition of the self. The anima is an intuition of the self. The, so the masculine, it's not the self. The mask, it's a bridge. The intuition, the masculine tree Newman points to a lack of differentiation of her masculine side because he's covered in tree bark. But this differentiation is currently at the expense of her feminine differentiation. So she is not really differentiated the animus. She's identified with it. This is her problem. So he can't operate as a bridge when he is not a differentiated animus if, if she's identified with him. So she's not using him as a bridge. She's, she's, uh, um, she's uh, just made unconscious by him. The fact that she it, it is, uh, um, you, you know, identifies with him doesn't uh, uh, differentiate, uh, doesn't uh, may integrate him. Now, uh, on uh, that, what the what the tree man told her is that he can't tell her anything, but he can let her look and see for herself. Now, this. Uh, very much reminded me of, of what the fox said in the uh, in the uh, in, in the little prince. He says he he's he's going to tell uh, the little prince a secret, and uh, uh, and and he waits until the little prince is about to leave. That the little fox represents Earth, you know, and uh, I mean that. And the little pr the the fox represents earth. The little prince met his redeemer in the fox, as she was meeting her redeemer in the tree and the tree uh, man. But um, he said he's going to tell. But instead, he's going to uh, uh, take the offer of the of the of the little golden snake who solves all riddles, you know, through his poison you know, and he bites the little prince so he can go return to the world he came from, from where he came from. So he can go see the, uh, uh, go, go uh, meet the little rose, but he's not going to live on earth anymore. And uh, uh, he says, and now here is my secret. It's a very simple secret. It is only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. And uh, uh, what what uh, what was said about the fox, uh, Pisanellus, who who wrote a lot of things about uh, different sort of an uh, encyclopedia of of animals. He says that um, that the the fox uh, um, it, it investigates things by his hearing, and. Uh, you can only perceive the divine mysteries with your ears. You cannot penetrate them with, with your eyes. So um, anyway, this is this object of her uh, uh, being told that she must look and see for herself. Uh, so um, the uh, idea is uh, this is the one thing that she couldn't believe is how the tree could manage to grow up and down at the same time. This was a, a great symbol to her of, of something that, that, that had not happened up to then. And uh, this was uh, Young uh, says, you know, a, a person whose roots are above as well as below is like a tree that grows simultaneously downwards and upwards. And the goal is neither height nor depth but the center. You know, this is this is the idea of the uh, philosopher's stone, which does not appear in nature. So it, it, the so so she then uh, draws the pictures of the uh, 
of the uh, philosophical, and I mean, the uh, comfortable tree and the uncomfortable tree. And we'll discuss those. Some uh, We've already sort of discussed them, but we'll discuss them a little more in depth so that we can, um, uh, you know, we keep moving here, but we, this is, this is, this is, this was her uh, first tree. Now this is the uncomfortable tree, okay? Now uh, the, the uh, so, so she sees the tree man, has this dream of the tree man who says that she can't, uh, he can't tell her anything, but he can let her see for herself. So then she has to, she's meditating upon the tree. Now here was her first uh, meditation on the tree, which is called the uncomfortable tree. And if you see at the top, there are uh, six vultures pulling up on the boughs of a leafless tree. All the leaves are blowing and there are 12 leaves blowing. And at the bottom, there are six arms pulling the roots down. So there's this incredible tension between the vultures. The vultures are um, you know, personifications of unconscious contents. She has a lot of dreams about a bird. She's an orn ornithologist. And birds are, uh, are personified contents of the unconscious. They fly in to dreams from the unconscious. Now, what's amazing about birds is the variety of them. And they all mean something. Eagles, ducks, geese, uh, um, uh, hawks, uh, uh, the phoenix, the vultures, the woodpeckers. They all have a different uh, conscious, the dove, the conscious uh, act. And, you know, remember uh, in Young's dream, of, of where he first met the anima, uh, a dove flies into a, 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 a great uh, open uh, area uh, with columns and uh, a green table. And he didn't know about uh, the emerald tablets at that point. And uh, he, at least he didn't understand what they meant. And uh, the, the little girl, or the dove turns into a girl and she goes and plays with uh, uh, his children, and then she comes back, and she says that she can, she can only come when uh, the male dove is busy with the twelve dead. <laughs> now, this inter interesting of, of this two time this the unconscious insists on the symbolism of the twelve. Now, uh, you know, I, you know, I just did a little uh, meditation on, on the 12 here. I mean, the, uh, you know, a triangle is uh, one, two, three. And if you take two triangles together, you have six. And then if you put them together, they are a four. You know, they're a square. And so then if you take the, 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 uh, the, the six vultures and the six uh, uh, arms pulling down, you have two triangles pulling down and two uh, triangles pulling up. But if you were to uh, move them apart or uh, reconcile them, you'll have two squares, you know, of fours. So the, uh, uh, two, two, three, two sets of three can be a four, and two, two, so two sets of six can be two fours if they are, are, are reconciled. And she does have a, a reconciliation. Uh, let, let's just go back, the, the, let's finish. I wanna make sure we didn't miss anything on the, uh, so the arms with the downward pull represent the instinctive realization of the need to go down into the unconscious. They are the strengths of the underworld. Uh, and uh, both in their feminine instinctual aspect and their chthonic, they, they are threatening in their own way as the black vultures. And we're going to talk about the vultures. These are the birds of the great mother. And yet they are a sim they're, 
they are uh, related to uh, her negative animus, the birds of the great mother. The vultures are the birds of the great mother. They, she's her in her devouring aspect as, as Kali, Medusa, uh, uh, Persephone, you know, she represents it, it, the, the vultures are her birds. And uh, it, uh, so um, the, uh, but there is, uh, so she, anyway, this uncomfortable tree is, is somewhat of a, uh, a, a restatement of her dream about the uh, wilderness fantasy where she is the mountain that is uh, buffeted by winds. Okay, now what are, are winds? You know, they are bad, in this case, the vultures and the winds that, that buffeted her are bad pneuma, okay? What's bad pneuma or bad spirit? No, you know, Young said that the spirit is a great trickster. You know, uh, it can give us these unbelievably uh, wonderful insights. And yet if they're not grounded in the feminine instinct of world, the feeling world, that they're, they're ephemeral, they're tricksters. And they are really what you call bad pneuma because they're unrooted. The, the pneuma needs to be rooted, the spirit. Now, this is the whole idea of becoming consciously feminine. And then the, the higher animus is to be in service to the conscious feminine, not uh, the other way around. The conscious feminine will never be in service to, uh, to Logos. Uh, Logos must be in service to her because she came first. You know, uh, it, it's very interesting, uh, this... Uh, uh, the idea of, of words anyway, you know, I've just been wondering about uh, where, where, she, where he says that I can't tell you, I can't tell you with words, but I can let you look for yourself. So, um, and, and then the fox also says that, 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 that it is only, uh, you can't, you, it, 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 you can only feel it in your heart, these realizations because what are words? I mean, you know, words are kind of a late development in, in, in uh, evolution. You know, each language, you know, I think some, somebody said right now there are 5,000 living languages, which is just what, you know, but they're, they're being used today. It's unbelievable. They, and how many there were in the history of, of man on earth and where did they come from? Where did languages and grammar and and vocabulary come from. So, so, you know, these words are sort of uh, differentiations of something that lies behind them, you know, but they're, <laughs> you know, like the finger pointing to the moon, they're, they're not that what lies behind them. They're sort of differentiations. And, and, you know, you can have a, 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 a language that has anywhere from 40,000 to 200,000 words. You know, I don't know how many are in the OED, uh, maybe somebody can look it up, the Oxford English Dictionary. But um, so now e each word points to a deeper mystery that lies behind it. So these words are surface phenomena, you know, and, and the word that or that phenomena or the, the uh, essence that lies behind the word, where the word came from. To different, the word is this differentiation of whatever phenomenon. You know, they took, at first you just saw something. And then you said, well, uh, you know, like uh, uh, Frida Kahlo used to tell people, uh, somebody who were taking art lessons from her and they, she was drawn, they were drawn, painting plants. And she came over and looked at his painting. Don't you see that there's a little purple in that plant? And he thought, no, I didn't see that. No, there's purple in it, you know. So the idea of differentiate, you see something, but then you 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 know, let's let's amplify it. What what does it consist of? You know, differentiate it. So anyway, what but but what the uh that thing that lies behind this differentiation, you know, the Hindus said 
No tongue can soil it. No words can express what lies behind the words. So anyway, that is this uh, idea of this, uh, this realization that uh, the tree can give. Uh, now, now this, she is certainly not ready for all this, you know, uh, now, but she said that she couldn't leave it where it was. She needed to draw the comfortable tree. Okay. So um, now the comfortable tree here, the roots are spread out comfortably under the earth. So, uh, and the tree is fully leafed. And instead of uh, six vultures pulling up, there is a phoenix at the top, uh, a songbird. And the woman down here, uh, who, by the way, is the first one we've seen, other than the two women analysts, is a maternal figure sitting there in great repose at the roots. So now her tree Newman is not the man covered in tree bark. Her tree Newman is is this uh, woman, you know. Uh, yes, uh, th that's right, uh, uh, Azine. Uh, there's some other uh, of the of the of the negative great mother. We're going to talk about them when we talk about the vultures. So anyway, um, it is uh, these. Uh, uh, th it represented. Uh, the, the state she hoped to attain. Now, I think, it, it, I don't think she knew what she hoped to attain, you know, but it was uh, uh, something that um, came up out of her. So, um, the, so the atmosphere of the comfortable tree is one of peace and lack of tension. And instead of bare branches, it's fully leafed. And instead of the sinister pole of the black vultures, there's the gay singing birds. The roots don't pull in conflict, but they support the structure. And the figure of the woman uh, whose, whose air of repose creates a feeling of harmony and relaxation gives the tree a clear feminine significance. And whereas uh, the tree man is, uh, is who's the... Uh, um, it, in the woman's dream would be the points to the animus problem. Uh, here is the feminine numen of the tree uh, in gives it uh, a creative meaning. Now, <laughs> I, I love that word creative. I mean, how we uh, don't really know what that means. You know, this word creative. Uh, you, you know, the word, uh, what, what I really think of, of the greatest image of what creativity is, comes from uh, the, the creator God in Hinduism, Brahman. Okay. No, so Brahman sits there and uh, here's how he creates something that he didn't expect or anticipate in it, could never have expected or anticipate comes into his head and suddenly now it's living right before it. a hippo, a giraffe, you know, an elephant. And, and he is surprised and shocked as everyone else. That's creativity. It is being uh, this conduit of the unexpected. Now, uh, just look, look at this, you, you know, uh, it, you know, you, you wonder where all these languages came from, you know, how did they arise spontaneously everywhere? And how, how are there 20,000 of them or 30,000 of them, you know? And uh, so also, where does music come from? Is uh, where do, does verse come from? Who, who, who really paints the, the artistic uh, creations that we have? And um you know who 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 was the you know this there's this wonderful image that uh that whoever did the, all of this you know is a, is a uh, uh uh combination of a great architect and engineer and a uh sent him, uh you know a a uh, uh romantic poet you know uh, the macaws, 
you know, the birds of paradise. How about the bower bird, you know, that creates that little uh, beautiful uh, bridge and brings all these little blue flower, flower, flower petals and surrounds his little, his little uh, marriage uh, arch with little blue petals, you know, and invites the uh, female bower bird to come here. <laughs> Where did that come from? You know, so, so this idea uh, too, you know, if you go, I, I think if you went to talk to Sophia, when she's sitting on, on the bare rock of earth and, and with all of this future uh, life in, in her, uh, uh, latent in her, you know, and it's going to finally flower out to Mozart and Picasso and James Joyce and uh, Bertolt Brecht and, you know, uh, Beethoven and all this, that's what it's going to flower out to and, and the macaw. Does she, you, you know, it all comes up unspoken or unbidden, you know. Uh, and, and so this is what creativity is. So anyway, that's just my little speech on creativity. The, 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 uh, uh, the feminine Newman uh, gives uh, the tree its creative meaning in the psychology of a woman. And this is, this comes up so much in uh, the fact uh, in her self, this patient, and in all of, uh, a lot of women in, in the second half of life, uh, what needs to come forth is, uh, and this is what we learned in the fairy tales, is the uh, feminine way of create creativity you know she needs to uh now uh, you know uh exp become her own living grail you know of, of pouring forth into the world and not creating children anymore but moon children she needs to have her moon child you know and uh, how's that going to come into being you know and that is really a collaboration between her and this fabulous greater awareness of which she's just a part. But she needs to become, a, that, that awareness needs to become aware in her too. This was what von Franz says, individuation means that you are permeable to the depths 24 hours a day. You know, you're open to the depths. So anyway, um, the, the idea here is that the phoenix, the bird at the top, is this, it represents this greater personality, this self, which is, uh, you know, the totality of our, who we are. You know, our, uh, our unconscious is, is all surface. I mean, our, our, our conscious mind, our ego is all surface, and the unconscious is all what lies beneath it, latent, waiting to bubble in to the sur up, up, up above the surface and come into uh, awareness above. Absolutely marvelous things. Absolutely unexpected, unanticipated things. If we're not life-denying, we have to be accepting to it. I mean, this is, this is the whole problem of the Poeri Turnuses. They're life-denying. You know, if you, if you, uh, and, and okay, the, also the negative animus is life denying. Don't start. You're not good enough. Be, other people are better than you. You know, this is all crap. That's life denying. That person who stands at the life switch, uh, ready to turn the light off, is life denying. That's not life. It's it is something much different than mine. So uh, anyway, this, uh, that, that's the idea of the creative tree. So um, the, uh, uh, let's see if there's anything else. Uh, as birds, um, the, uh, uh, the, the meanings of the vultures are, are very interesting because they are the birds of the great mother. You know, they are, uh, we saw that in, in uh, Chateau Huyuk, you know, uh, the, uh, this, um, this is uh, the great mother from Chateau Huyuk. By the way, you know, this is, 
um, Chital Huyuk is uh, up to 13,000 years old. You know, uh, it's just a marvelous place. This is the great mother with her two lions. I mean, this is just so amazing. These things that just ferment up, up from the depths. And uh, uh, here, here were the birds of the great mother. They, uh, they, they have to do with, uh, a zine it knows a lot about this, these mysteries of, of the, uh, of, of the, um, the devouring mother or that mother that um, takes back. You know, she also, she gives, but she takes back. You know, she's, uh, uh, she's the underworld and she's also the mother, you know, both. And so she has these birds and, and she also has um, as her, her flying beings, the honeybees who, uh, you know, uh, fertilize the flowers. But so anyway, it's it's very interesting that the negative animus in in the in the uh, uncomfortable tree is uh, the uh, uh, is is uh, are the birds of the great mother. So anyway, he's saying that it's just fascinating to see these uh, unconscious throwing these symbols uh, into the realm of her conscious mind, and although her conscious mind is not yet able to grasp the meaning. And we'll find that in the subsequent dreams. That's the thing. There's no, the doors of heaven never open. You know, I mean, you get these fabulous dreams. I mean, Diane, your fabulous dream. And then well, let's look at the dreams after. They're, you know, they're very ordinary. So what happened? You know, uh, so uh, anyway, uh, the, uh, the, uh, so the symbolism, nevertheless, conditions the comp conscious mind to the gradual enlargement of its territory. Now, this is the word, what imagination means. It comes from the root to magnify, to enlarge. And what are we enlarging? We're enlarging the surface consciousness by letting it, by letting the depth consciousness and surface consciousness to uh, be aware of each other and, and to collaborate. So the depths, depths and surface must mix. <laughs> the depths and the surface must mix. And when they mix, uh, really, uh, suddenly now you are alive. That's what re real life is in the second half of life. You know, uh, now there's much more involved in it. Uh, uh, that has to do with with relatedness with uh, other beings. You can't do this isolated, but uh, it's all one. It's very complicated and complex, but it's all uh, fits together. Well, let's go to the. Uh, oh, what time is it? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm almost done. Jeez. Oh, well, um, let, let's just go through this. Uh, uh, I'm going to go through the uh, these dreams, or one of them, real quickly. I didn't realize I went on so long there. Well, well, here's the, the next dream she had following that dream. She finds herself together with two men, her younger brother and her man friend, exploring a foreign town. So she's exploring the unconscious. And she goes off on her own. She leaves the two animus alone and is now discovering herself, uh, herself as a, uh, as a uh, individual entity. And what does she see? She, she sees a cathedral, like a great church or a great tower in, uh, of enormous size. And uh, built on next to it is an ugly structure, the shrine of something or other. And sh then she can hear music uh, coming from another building adjoining the cathedral. And when she reaches it, she walks through one side of a cloister that means a closed space. And, and there is an old woman there uh, who's, who's a layman. She's not religious at all. And she steps out of this cloister, uh, opens the double doors of the building for me. She opens the doors for me. And I look in and I see a square enclosure with trees. And... Uh, uh, it, but it looked private, and I did not venture to go in. 
And uh, so after taking a look, she returns to the two men. The men do not know about the cathedral. They don't know anything about this great tower of enormous size. I never, no, we didn't see that. But they did buy postcards of the ugly shrine. <laughs> Picture postcards. So uh, now she... Uh, the the now she understood the cathedral as real Christianity. You know now uh, what is real Christianity? I mean, you you gotta uh, give uh, it its due. It's a wonderful myth. You know, uh, you know, Christianity is a profound teaching. It's a gigantic attempt to master the secrets of the soul. It's all mythical. You know, the, the Annunciation, the, the birth of the divine child, you know, uh, the fact that um, uh, John the Baptist, uh, you, you know, uh, he, he has to be baptized and uh, has to go, uh, he experiences an initial death. You know, baptism is really a symbolic death. The fact that he, uh, uh, you, you know, is supernatural, uh, his uh, his suspension, you know, between two worlds, between the inner and the outer world, and uh, the uh, and then his later uh, the mystery that von Franz says no one understands <laughs> the resurrection of the body. She says that is one that she says she never understood. But anyway, um, so now these three uh, churches. Uh, she would have liked to enter the cathedral, but she didn't have a hat. The rule is you can't go without one. And uh, she was a high Anglican. But what's interesting about her is that the uh, there's these three churches. Uh, one is the conventional. And let's just tell, say what the conventional is. The conventional is denotes unquestioning containment, unquestioning containment an unconscious identity. Now that's the conventional church. Now we need the conventional church, by the way. If she didn't have the, this, this is why she has no hat because she was not ever exposed to conventional, conventionality. You know, the one thing the Poer Eternus needs is to be a collective man of her, the herd because he thinks he's special. So he's inflated. So the only we, one of the things he needs to do is to become collective. And that's, that's not the end point, but he needs to become collective before he can cure himself as this poer. Go to, become, join the army and your number 344, keep your area clean. You know, that's a way to cure the, the poer. Okay. Now, uh, the, so the collective church, the one which she says is real, uh, Christianity is a decision to accept the values of the collectivity. It's a conscious decision. So now it's not an unconscious identification as it was in the conventional church, but it is a conscious identification. The third church is the, is the mystery of the individual experience. Now this is, uh, I believe what we were meant to what we were born to do and really uh through each life uh that is is lived uh that uh, actually you, you know what um uh you know edward edinger says that uh you know it, it when uh i believe it was abraham or maybe it was lot who's negotiating to save uh, sodom and gomorrah you know, uh, he says, if I can find a thousand men who are living the individual experience, will you save it? He says, oh, yes. And he says, what if I can find a hundred? Oh, yes, yes. What if I can find 10? Oh, yes. I'll, if you can find 10 who, who are living their lives as they were meant to be lived, I will save it. And Edward just, Edward Edinger says, we should all live as if it only takes one. You know, to live as we should live, you know, uh, which is, um, 
just to recognize that this uh, entity within us is alive and uh, our destiny is to be not its uh, uh, servant, uh, but to be in service to it, you know, and uh, as the empty vessel, as the one, see, here's, we are, we are these conscious, and we have all these words, you, you know, do you think that the, uh, <laughs> that the nature, uh, that nature before there were these bipedal hominids who created language or, or who suddenly became the uh, uh, recipients of words, uh, you, you know, uh, they, they, they have these words now that they can use to uh, differentiate what the unconscious sends them in image form. And by the way, the dreams maker is using words too. It's learned the words as well as you have, you know. And, uh, but, but the idea is, uh, I think, you know, uh, in the image of temperance, scary that you uh, mentioned, uh, I, I wish you uh, would give us that little uh, bit at the start where, uh, you, you know, the, the, the idea of, of circulating the ideas uh, uh, from, uh, you, you know, there was almost a description of this whole thing that she's doing. Well, we're going to go next time into the dream of the circle uh, that she needs to put the uh, uh, parts of her psyche in and then a, a house that she wasn't aware of, that she wonders if she should pay the rent on, a, a stammerer. She's talking to a psychological man, but he on the phone, but he stammers, I, and I, she can't understand anything he says. And uh, uh, so, so we're going to keep seeing these. So we had this wonderful uh, image of the tree man, man with tree bark, and then these the comfortable tree and the uncomfortable tree. Uh, but uh, this is a long road. And, and by the way, you know, she, uh, uh, there's another dream where she uh, uh, moves into a new room. And uh, uh, what Adler says is that moving is this image of transit. And that's what analysis really is. And, you know, uh, in, in uh, uh, when uh, they, there's, they, they call, that when Christ takes the cross and walks to Golgotha, you know, that's called the transit or the Via Dolorosa, the way of suffering. And it's, so it's really an analysis because uh, it's a pilgrimage, you know. So all analysis, all of this is a transit. It's a, it's a transit and a transformation. But the idea of there always has to be movement. Now, remember, she was stony and fixed. And her great hope on, on her first uh, uh, visit to Adler was things are moving. I'm not stony anymore. So she's starting on the journey, you know. Uh, so anyway, I didn't get as far as I hoped to get. But uh, we, we can just uh, go around. Gary, do you want to? to see if there's, sure. I'm sorry, it took a little longer. You know, I've, I've got a question to begin with. Yeah. So Jung said that um, the life behind the word, mm -hmm. uh, no, no tongue can sully it. Do you think maybe that means that the life behind the word is a symbol? Um, well, uh, you know, uh, this, this is uh, expressed in this thing that there are no words or systems of thought that can possibly contain boundless life okay the the idea is that life itself is uh inexpressible it is so deep so deep so deep now the words are uh what are the words they are a differentiation of this magic of being alive you know uh but each uh what do you think of, of words? I mean, they uh, how deep do they go, Gary? I don't know. I mean, they seem they 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 are intimations, oh. but if they not are not combined with a wordless, you know, remember uh, that um, uh, what the fox told the little prince is that um, uh, you you only uh, and and you 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 can only apprehend. Uh, 
without words. You know, you Just can't, you, your realizations need to be wordless or the, or it, when they are combined with the sensate and the feeling function. Uh, now, what do you think, Gary? I mean, just what's your theory or philosophy of language, I guess? I mean, to me, you know, I think you have to look at poetry because poetry, yes. you know, it expresses really what you cannot express in words because it does. It takes us into the sensate. It takes us into the, you know, into the depths of our individual feeling. It, but what it brings up, do you think? Now, I'm just, I, we're having a discussion. Is is this intimations you know, of something that lies behind it. It's sort of, it sort of says, have you considered this? Let me try to color it for you, but not with colors, but with verse and with lyricism. Let me see if I can bring it forth from the depths, you know, and here, here's my attempt. And, you know, no. and, and I'm a master at this and, and I'm not here when it happens. Like Young says, it comes, it, it just came through me. Oh, sorry, Gary. But just oh, yes. No, what? I think that's that's the that's the perfect way to say it because it's, you know, with if because of our changes to language and because of how we now express ourselves so efficiently, you know, it's very much a logos type of thing. But when you move outside of that, to, mm -hmm. then then suddenly it, it, I think it does it, it does call in the intimations. It does call in the depths. And so it, you know, it moves out of logos, it moves into the feminine. And so then it becomes somewhat limitless. Yeah, I think that once, now now one thing that, uh, that, that the fox, according to Von Franz, the fox was saying to the little prince is the, uh, the, the, the true realizations are always near at hand. You know, they always have to do with what's feminine and is right in front of our eyes. A any a thing that is abstract. Go ahead, Azine. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hi. So I just want to share something. Um, in um, Gibsonian uh, theory, the magical consciousness is about hearing. Yes. So that was my question for a long time. Why hearing? And he emphasizes um, all the time. He emphasizes on. Um, language and words and etymology. So he, in German, um, Horen means listen, to listen, and Gehoren, Gehoren, that's the root, means to belong, yes. to be, being. So the state of listening and hearing is about anima, it's about receiving. Mm -hmm. But um, my question, my question was, the magic is often related to a word, like in um, Islamic, in Quran, we have uh, kun fayakun, which means um, God says be, and then it is. So um, it's about the magical word. We also have abracadabra, yeah. which is um, um, from the root avra, kadavra means mm. I create as I speak. It's Aramic. And um, so I was, my, my question was that, that magic is about uttering the magical spell, the it, word, and things happen. They have apotropaic power, you know, uh, apotropaic power. You know, you, you know, if you speak of the devil, it he appears. will appear. You know? Yeah. You know, and uh, uh, you, you, you know, sailors, you don't call the Black Sea the Black Sea. <laughs> you know, yeah. you, you use some euphemism for it, you know. So, so words have apotropaic power. That's very important, too. Yeah. So, what does that mean? I, too, I mean, I, it'd be interesting to hear what, what other people's thoughts are about. Um, uh, about the 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 how do words uh what what is your do you have any more thoughts about how words and nature are related yeah so my question was that um i couldn't um see why magical is about listening and not about yeah. seeing magical, or is it seeing or, or listening 
So the answer was um, the word that happens in magical world, it, it comes through us. Yes. So you hear something you're receiving with your anima, and then it manifests, it comes through your channel yeah. into being mm -hmm. and through uttering a word, the magical word. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference. And um, anima is also about image. Um, uh, animus is about word. Hermes is about word. Persephone is about image. Prayer. Yeah. Prayer. You know. So that was my thought that um, the relation between anima and animus and creation, because animus um, initiates, initiates yeah. uh, the creation, but I think anima is the force. Anima is the energy that comes to uh, manifest. Yeah, it, in the beginning was the word, you know. I mean, in that respect, I think it, it is the creation of consciousness, you know. So what do you think about that, Azine? The fact that um, the, uh, or let's hear everybody, but I mean, it's the idea of that, uh, uh, that, that um, consciousness comes into being and then magic comes into being. I mean, is there, is there a possibility of having magic without consciousness i you think know. they're the same yeah they are they are they are absolutely the same but yeah uh, gary uh, how does that address why don't you go around the room but i mean how does that address what well, you were talking about i guess i've got a i have a question for you uh, you know because you've been studying that you know that one i don't i don't know if he's a philosopher or psychologist but where you had the archaic uh, you know type of consciousness and the magical and then you know more of the logos and how do you think that fits in with what you're saying does that does that come from that or is that outside of it um it's the magical consciousness what i was what i was talking about archaic is just like a dreamless dream you can't really talk a lot about archaic it's just being and not being aware of being it's a dream. And then magical and then mythical, which is about um, heart. We come to the heart and we start to tell stories and um, define the world. And then it's mental, which is about othering and opposites and recognition and knowledge, then integral. But um, yeah, that was the part I could relate with the fox uh, here. And the animal and utterance. yeah, the, it, well, uh, let's just go through the images. The fox who represents the earth, the the woman and the man in tree bark who represent the rooted world. I can't tell you because that's not rooted. I can't tell you that's not rooted. The yeah. only way you you are going to know is to be rooted because you're not rooted. You know, yeah. you you are not near you and what does rooted mean you know rooted in what well you would say rooted in the earth but that means rooted in, in uh, us not we're not trees that means we're rooted in 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 our bodies and our instinctive life you can't go far from it you have to and that is this uh the the isn't that really what we talk about when we talk about the underworld aren't we really talking about uh, it's more physical it's about grounding and physicality and earth so the 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 complete um, image is lilith in the trunk mm -hmm. on the branches uh sits anzu which is the first human man yeah. it is made so it's um a bird that can fly, the sky mm -hmm. god, right? Yes. And in the roots, there's a snake uh, coiling around the egg. Mm -hmm. So the roots, um, I think here it's about mother earth and father sky and um, somehow Lilith is um, the bridge. 
as anima and animus are bridges to the self. Um, it's a connector. There's the she's the connector. Well, it's very deep, and we don't have to go on that. Let's. I mean, we. I. I mean, I. I'm just saying that the uh, idea of the uh, of the word and and the creativity and the rootedness and the fact that she's not rooted. That's her sickness, and yet her. So her real. So she can't attain her her. Her, uh, he can't tell her, he can't use words to describe what she uh, needs. The man in tree bark, by the way, yeah. the man in tree bark cannot tell her anything, but he can show her. And 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 he, what he's saying is that you you won't know unless you're covered in tree bark or a bear shirt or some kind of instinctive element. You need to wrap yourself up like a bear, like, like in, in rose red and, uh, uh, yeah. You know, it's, one of the, it's manifestation, right? right. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the things that struck me about those two drawings of the, of the trees is the one that had the vultures above and the hands pulling below. You know, that one, I, I looked at it and then it was divided. You know, there was this, this split between the above and the below. And I just looked at that and I thought the center cannot hold, you know, yes. it's torn apart. <laughs> and then you looked at the other one and what's at the center, you know, the feminine presence. And it's, yeah. you know, it just feels thick and, it, and solid. And, and it has leaves, you know, which I think are, you know, kind of a form of aliveness and blossoming. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the image was just beyond brilliant. Yeah, well, just, I, I wanna add a little thing about the yin and yang, um, a circle. Uh, I talked about it before that when they are not um, in harmony. Do you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. frozen in for me. So when they're not in harmony and they're in fight, they're battling each other, the whole circle is torn apart. And this image is like the birds are tearing this uh, tree apart. The roots, the hands from the roots, they're being torn apart. But the other image is about merging and making love and um, this balance, moving balance between yin and yang and reconciliation and emergence. Yeah, well, let's see, let's, that's beautiful, Azine. That's wonderful. Let's I'll go, uh, ahead and here, go around. Yeah, um, yeah, go around and see what everybody. So, uh, Aline, would you like to go next? Yeah, I'm fascinated by all this uh, discussion about words and how I'm also impressed with our uh, patient who can draw a centered tree with her in the middle of it. I think that's incredible. You know, I wish I could make such a drawing in my art. It would be amazing, you know, because art is the kind of expression to me of active imagination without any words. Yes. That's and good. I'm I must say in the second half of my life, there's been a lot more art and dancing and poetry. I never liked poetry when I was young, couldn't understand it. So here we are today, I love it. That's my preferred method of kind of reading anything possibly. But yeah, thank you Azine and thank you Craig and Gary, great. I really enjoyed the all the thing about thinking about when mankind didn't have words and how they evolved. And I, I'm always wondering about the consciousness of animals and I see them as kind of pre-human, you know, <laughs> that yeah. with their brains were only as big as ours. They say that uh, cooking food is what expanded, exploded the size of our brains. And that's when civilization and language and all that. Actually, they say civilization started with um, the invention of brewing alcohol. So you need a tower to store the grain, you need a guard to, to tax the grain, and so on and so forth. So that's my two cents worth today. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I want to just say my own theory is that the dream uh, that 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 Master Bear has dreams every bit as 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 uh, vivid as we do uh the only difference now is that uh, we we have this aspect of us that's separated from nature so now you have the dreams 
where you have an entity that's separated from nature and a and an entity that is in nature. So uh, you know it, it and 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 you know humans used to be in what was called a participation mystique, especially when you were living in the village compound with 250, 50 to 250 people, you know, and that was the maximum that you would ever be with. And uh, now you live in cities of, of 20 million, you know, uh, and uh, uh, with all this in, uh, separation of labor, you know, you've got all kinds of crafts and everything. Uh, it, it is uh, just, it's just it, how, now I think that's actually good for uh, the evolution of consciousness, but it also has its downside, you know, too, you know. But I, I will say this too, any drawing is an act of imagination, any painting. Now, especially if you do it, of your own images. You know, what Young said sometimes, he, he, he met a lot of artists, he thought, that were uh, just strictly conduits. And they were strictly almost like shamans. You know, a shaman is, uh, maybe Kat could tell us more about this, but a shaman is just a conduit. And they're not anything about uh, doing any uh, tra transformation internally. Mm -hmm. They're, they're healers and, uh, and just a, a, a opening from the depths the, out to the outer world, like a medium, you know, say. But um, yeah, that, I, I, Zine, I'm saying anytime you do a, 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 a and Young said, you don't have to be a, a good artist. He says, art is not the point. Remember that uh, one uh, woman that told him, uh, that uh, when he asked, what am, what am I doing here? You know, when he's writing the black book and, and she said, comes. This is art. Yeah, this, is, this art. is art. And Jung said, no, it's not art. <laughs> no, it's not art because it's transformational where, where art is something totally, an aesthetic. It's aesthetic. And it's not, what he was doing was not aesthetic at all. So the image does not have to be aesthetic. What it has to do is it has to um, uh, possess the energy that only you recognize, of, uh, bring it back, bring it forth, apotropaically of, 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 that, uh, of that dream. Every time you see it, you look at it and you say, oh, I, I'm right back in the atmosphere of that dream. And I just remembered something that I hadn't remembered before a flavor of it, but I can't even express what that flavor is. So Kat, would you like to make a, a comment on uh, the shaman? Um, well, um, I haven't been across shamans. I've been a lot of come across shamanic practitioners and the, the sh shaman or shamanic practitioner is a negotiator between the world of the spirits and humans and you know in a lot of the cases um it should be never the twain shall meet because <laughs> simply because to have the interference of spirits or on human activity and vice versa can have um quite um serious consequences um as for like personal transformation there there is that but there, it's a case of um kind of like levels of initiation a dismemberment so for sh shamanic practitioners or shamans uh, having lots of deaths as such is very um is is kind of common um uh and kind of that's that really um in that respect however i was thinking about the lady's dream with the postcards of the ugly yeah. churches or things like that. And I had an image of, um, back in Victorian times, it was actually quite common to take pictures of dead relatives. Yeah. There, there was that macabre thing. And I kind of wondered if 
that was like a reference to churches, the mm. stone buildings, where as like Druids, well, pick Druidry, that they sort of celebrated earth and animism and things like that. The creation, the creator is nature, where we celebrate, you know, Christianity is celebrating the awareness as such within stone sort of buildings it's kind of for the druids and things like that it's kind of doesn't make sense because the divine or whatever is in nature mm -hmm. and i was kind of, so those images of ugly chapels i could see that in that way of what seems like dead bodies it's kind of dead you know mm -hmm. i'm not being rude about christianity or churches but that's the kind of thing that i got from that dream because um you know it's all very much about um a life and life and death and those sort of natural processes which druids and that respect and appreciate and then the trees for druidry trees are kind of like uh, the ancestors they're the wise ones you know to be to have wisdom of a tree because they're rooted in earth and their branches reach up to the heavens, to the skies. So it's all, you know, um, linked, it's all connected. So, and there is um, tree language, the Oum, which is like the I Ching, you see. So trees are very much important for a Druidry. And the fact of in Druidry, again, words are very important because you have the bardic tradition, which again is the, the storytellers, but they also have the, um, the capability through their words, through their stories to literally transport you mentally um, into a different space to, because these stories and myths are very much alive, very much the fabric of the, the land and very much runs through the blood as well. And so therefore the words literally have the power to heal or, or literally curse. So it was in Druidry, what is the most powerful thing that you have? Well, it is your mouth, it is your words, because for that very reason. Um, yeah, so I mean, and that's it. Um, that, that's beautiful. That's Thank you. Wow, that, that was just such powerful imagery. So next time, you know, and it was, you know, when you were telling us all that, I thought, oh, my gosh, so much of us could just be put in the poetry. So next time, bring us a poem on some section of that, you know? Yeah. Well, the bards, you know, who could not uh, even deviate one word from uh, from a, a big, long, uh, you know, like the uh, saga, the eddas, the, po the poetic eddas. And then, you know, even in uh, the Torah, you know, <laughs> If, if, if they if they made one letter wrong they had to throw the whole thing out because yeah. it was it was magic you know I mean the each word was abs was alive you know uh, a living entity so yes sorry, I, I, I we can't just go ahead no sorry I was gonna say part of the bardic initiation was um, literally deprivation of light they literally mm -hmm. have to encase themselves with darkness and sort of in that form incubate the the uh, myths the stories they had to incubate them they had to literally go within uh inside and retrieve those um old stories a lot of the time and possibly make new ones but it's that ancient knowledge that of the the people you see mm -hmm. and um so so that was and it wasn't just four or five we're talking of hundreds and be able to recite them off the top of your head and you know you and they have actual um druidic sort of colleges um in we still well does exist in um anglesey and bangor so the idea of it kind of being um you know, fanciful, you know, um, there was, you know, druidic training from bards over to the druids. We, you know, the, the, the um, universities or whatever are in Bangor and Anglesey. So, uh, 
And um, yeah, sorry, but that's beautiful, so, I mean, Ken. on the along the along the same lines, I just have to skip over to the chat. One thing that is input in there, I download full ideas, especially when I talk to my students. Whole poems, it's permeability. And then she added Terry the symbol, but I, I'm, I'm just looking at this. It's almost like she knew what you were going to say, Kat. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Did, go ahead. Go, oh, well, if you got something to say, go ahead. Otherwise, I'll call on John. Okay. Yeah. No, I don't. No. Oh, uh, John. Oh, hi. Thanks. Um, no, I don't really have much. I just think I'm out of my depth, but. Um, but one thing I thought about when she was talking about the, the dream of the tree man, and I don't know if it relates or not, because I don't know that much about Egyptian uh, mythology, but wasn't uh, Osiris's coffin inside of a tree or something like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, again, when she drew the pictures of the comfortable and uncomfortable tree, I just thought, you know, the uncomfortable tree, it was like the, the dreams, x-ray vision of her current situation of that, holding that tension between the pairs of opposites. And, um, when uh, the man said to her, I can't tell you, but I can show you or whatever. To me, it just, I, I, I can't remember where the quote came from, but it's like the best things in life can't be told. The second best can only be misunderstood um, because it's, you have to, you know, have to live it. And uh, I guess, so, but that's really kind of all I have. Thanks. Yeah, that that really was Heinrich, Heinrich Zimmer told that to Joseph Campbell. Uh, but I mean, I think uh, both Azine, uh, you know, one thing I was going to say, Azine said, uh, that uh, when, when consciousness and words are uh, and magic are all the same thing, you know, they came into being simultaneously. And you know what what Young said was uh, what the ancients called magic, we call psyche. You know, uh, so so yeah. That I mean, you guys have really uh, fleshed out the magic of words between Cat and Azine and. Uh, and I, yeah, that's beautiful. Well, Diane, would you like to go next? Yeah, um, I really have a lot to say and we're running out of time. Yeah. I don't know if I can get it all in, but um, first of all, um, words came from nature that animals communicate and um, they have through sound, of course, a lot of it through sound. There may be other ways. Of course, they can be trained to communicate in other ways. But, um, and um, so it's a natural evolution and um, the written word is also part of a natural um, evolution. And as sound is very uh, the primal um, and it, it carries over into the spoken word as well as the written word and poetry, of course, and uh, storytelling and the bards and all of that. But also we have, it's a tool that we've been given to create with and also literature. Uh, I think of Proust yes. and um, because I'm trying to tell you now the stream of consciousness, a writer from Ireland, what's his name? <laughs> You know, uh, oh, jo James Joyce. James Joyce. Mm -hmm. And all of that written word can be heard in the mind when you read. And um, then also Chomsky and other linguists have said it came forth. It just came through us and it came even all of those different languages. They have a very similar patterns of grammar, etc., and intonation. And of course, they all of the languages evolved because we have different cultures, different environments. And so that's all part of it. And about 
creating, you know, because we are um, creators. I mean, it's not literal, but that God created us in his image. And so we are all creators. And evolutionarily, we could um, evolve. And that's what we really need in this world now is to have a, you know, a big leap in our evolution if we're going to save ourselves in humanity. Um, so cr the creative uh, creativity in man cannot match nature. Nature is the great creator, but we can evolve. And we really need to evolve big time right now. Um, then the other things are... I wanted to ask you what Chatal Hayuk is, Craig. Yeah. Oh, it's just a, uh, it is a settlement in Anatolia, which was, is now Turkey, uh, okay. which was uh, uh, dedicated to the great mother. I mean, it was okay. just unbelievable uh, shrines to uh, the great mother from you know, it, it, it could be 7,000 years ago. It could be up to 11,000 years ago. Okay. And then the last thing is um, the trickster. Okay. Yeah. So the trickster is the, uh, I guess, the bad noumena of the magician. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, the trickster is uh, is one who who uh, may, you you would know more about that, Gary. What do you think the trickster is? I would take cat's input on this. Actually, I mean, not well as in, or yeah, as in, because what do you think on this as in for the trickster? Trickster is one of the faces of Hermes. Mm -hmm. Um. And it shifts, uh, it's related to shapeshifters. It twists the reality, it twists its shape, it twists things. And um, it's related it's, to magic, isn't it? Yeah, it is magic. Yeah. Because Hermes in first layers, it can twist reality like lying, you know? But at higher levels, it's magic because it can really change the reality. Um, so, um, yeah, trickster, I would say it's a part of. Um, well, it, it's someone who, who uh, you, you know, there was the, in, in the Lakotas, uh, Black Elk was uh, considered a trickster because it was a people who would do exactly the opposite of what the conventional world would do. And they would try to shock the conventional world uh, by, uh, by uh, you, you, you know, and there was, a, you know, the king always had a, uh, a fool, you know, who would, who would uh, actually make poetry uh, that would make fun of the king and his military leaders and in telling what fools they were. But every, they needed these people to, I mean, they actually tolerated them because they thought it was, uh, uh, you, you know, that they needed that, you know, this, you this remember, criticism. You remember my presentation? I had a presentation here. Yes, yes, yes. That was, you that was were trickster. talking, yeah. yeah, you were talking about that. The clown, for instance, mm -hmm. was a, a very a trickster. Well, so to go back to her dream, where you know the trickster just tore everything up right mm -hmm. and you said that it was because she's not rooted in the feminine is that what you, did you say that is that yeah. i understand well, correctly? well the thing is it, it, you know let's just take the idea that there were that the two men who went to the ugly shrine uh and bought picture postcards of it you know and didn't see the cathedral and they certainly didn't see the uh, wise old woman and the and the it's the walled in enclosure. Why are they so conventional? It's because she 
doesn't integrate the animus, she identifies with it because she rejects the mother. That's now that's not my words. That's, that's Adler's words that she rejected the mother, her own mother. And uh, so she was not using, integrating the animus. And so she, he says, it's not the fault that her, to, her animus is too collective. It's that she identifies with it and doesn't integrate it. So, and, but, and, but it's primarily because she uh, uh, rejects the feminine or the mother. Okay, so I'd like to, I'm looking for clues to the ending of my dream mm -hmm. where Jerry Lewis kills all of the people in the park and I'm looking for clues to what that can mean, uh, mean. And I'm not looking so much for personal, but that would be good too. But what it means to the collective. It really is the trickster. Yeah, uh, Jerry yes. Lewis would be the trickster. And right. So, so the trickster comes in and uh, he, he's really telling you, let's not talk about the collective. What he's telling you is that um, uh, you can't be inflated about this. You can't take all this, yeah. this absolutely fabulous dream you had and, and be inflated by it. Uh, yeah, and, you said that. Yeah. yeah. I'm just, I, I, I guess that's my guess, but. But what does it mean collectively to, not just to me, but archetypically or whatever? Mm -hmm. I mean, why? Because you said that's typical of the way a dream like that would end. So does it mean that you have to go back and go retrace your path and, uh, I don't know. But anyway, you don't have to answer now. But yeah. I'm I am looking for clues. Yes. To, well, well, let's discuss that uh, later. I'll talk yeah. to you more about that later. Let's talk Thank about you. the next Saturday. Yes. Well, let's yeah. hear. Did you a have Ava. something else? And then we'll go to Ava. Zim, did you have a, a comment? Your hand is up. Um, if everybody has spoken, I have something to add. I, go yeah, ahead, Eva. 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 Yes, I try to remember the chakra meditation. I like it very much. And it was yes. about I yeah. am accepted. <laughs> but uh, it has been so much said through the time, uh, to, through this session. Uh, I am uh, very grateful that I told my dream about the bear <laughs> because yeah. I, I don't think I could be able to understand all this deep it's so it feels so uh, good uh, and if i haven't told the dream in the group i couldn't have got it no. either it wouldn't have helped that i just was dreaming it was your uh, way of taking care of my dream uh, craig and gary uh, uh, gary especially yeah. i remember you took it very seriously and, and suddenly it came so close and uh, almost physical, yeah. a physical uh, experience. Your, your redeemer uh, is a bear, a man in a bear shirt. Yeah, I mean, you have it, that, that, that's uh, so yeah. beautiful. It's just yes. absolutely beautiful. But, but is I, am I gehören? The, yeah. the, <laughs> the Deutsch word. It's very li like uh, the Swedish, uh, att tillhöra, to att höra till, to um, connect to. And uh, it's, uh, by the way, it's the same, uh, that's religion, religion is also connecting, uh, reconnect. And um, that's the most important uh, thing today that I all, this time I have been thinking of about the bear connection and um, I can't understand how people that don't have uh, some kind of um, a like experience can, it's such a, a, a special language we have in this group and uh, I absolutely feel the need, even if I, I have been um, 
studying religion in un, on un, university level and i familiar with many terms it's it's uh, very deep as you said craig very deep uh, level and um, um the the second uh, thing i was uh, thinking about uh, i was a little bit irritated to you craig mm. because you said that art is aesthetic and it's not just aesthetic. no i i art didn't mean be art a, is it, aesthetic it, it, if, yes. if if you are it a could be yes. yeah if you're a medium yes. If you're only yes. a medium, I know art. what you mean. Yeah. I, I know what you mean, but but it all art isn't just aesthetics, no. and uh, of course, yeah. Yes, I, I would like. Uh, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I think that was all. Oh, well, Asen, would you uh, you have something you want to say? Yeah, I just want to add. Um... Um, the same thing that I said, but just like a little bit of expansion, that the difference between black magic and white magic, or as I said, sorcery and wizardry, or um, other uh, uh, differentiations, um, it's just that um, it depends when this magic or this word is coming from a connection or from separation, all right? Mm -hmm. So in alchemy, it is the difference between having a container, making something in a container, or making something in a vessel. Um, when you are connected, and it, it, it was really interesting what you said, uh, what you quoted from Marie von Franz, uh, Craig, that individuation is being connected, is being permeable all the time. Mm -hmm. So what we, we usually think about individuation is separation, egoistic separation, I'm different. But at the end of the process of individuation, through archetypes, uh, finding archetypes and common um, consciousness, we realize that we are one. We are different with others, but we are the same. So connection is the key here. And um, Castaneda uh, uh, talked about two kinds of magicians. The first one is um, the stalker, and the other one is a dreamer. So the stalker is a magician that comes to a place and just by being present, it changes everything. So the magic is, happens through their being there. But the dreamer is uh, a more conscious magician, like uh, she or he thinks about what she wants to create and then goes through the process of creating and manifestation. So there's the, the difference. But I also wanted to mention what happened here between me and Kat, that we were talking about the same thing because we are we're using different words. We are two people, people in different countries, but we were at the same place, you know? So there was connection. So that was magic happening here. <laughs> did, did Diane, did you have a, a closing yeah, word I, for us? I did have one thing to say and that, and it relates to just about what everyone has said and, you know, that and Vedanta and, um, and Jung too, I believe, that beauty, truth, um, love and consciousness are all one. And that's how we connect with each other. That is beautiful. Well, thank you so, so much, everybody. And we'll, uh, We'll have a dream session next Saturday, Diane. We can go over your uh, what your further thoughts about Jerry Lewis. Uh, what, <laughs> he, what? No, seriously. I uh, know, but he makes me just his name makes me laugh, Jerry oh. Lewis. <laughs> yeah, well, Sorry. he's he's in your dream. He's not Jerry Lewis. Let's put it. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Azine and Aline and John and Diane and Ava and Kat. We'll see you all next time, guys. I have a quick question. Yeah, go ahead, John. Sin mentioned the presentation that she gave on the clown. Did you record that and put that on YouTube? Yes, I did, and you okay. have to see it. Uh, I will send it send it out in a link. It's, Thank you it's, very much. It was amazing. amazing. Thank you, Thank you. Azine. That was just beautiful. And okay. I will soon have another presentation on Ariadne's, on Ariadne's threat. It's almost. Yeah, I think next week, isn't that the first Sunday of the month? 
and uh, we, we'll, we if, yeah, we can all do, just do sharing and we just do it as long as it lasts uh, for next time. But Azeen, we can have a special session for your presentation though. Yeah, thank you. Okay, all right. Bye -bye. Thanks everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. We'll see you all later. Bye-bye.